Good morning um, and welcome. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, we are the first uh, session in a four session series that's called Inside the Master Surgeons OR. And this is the brainchild of our um, fearless leader, uh, Chuck Ballmer and Dave Kuby. And the idea is for us to get to know um, on, a, on a deeper level um, some of the icons in pancreas and liver surgery. Um, this is modeled after the uh, TV show from the British TV uh, network um, led by James Lipton in inside the actor's studio where he interviews uh, on, on, on couches um, some of the iconic actors and helps us get to know them. And, and the idea is that the audience there is a lot of uh, young growing actors and actresses. And so during that show and hopefully during this session, some of those actors and actresses will come up to the microphone and ask the um, ask our celebrity um, questions that they have, um, either you know personal or professional, um, and, and hopefully um, help us all to learn more from Dr. Um, Fernandez de Castillo. So I have with me um, today Dr. Carlos Fernandez de Castillo. Um, Dr. Uh, Fernandez de Castillo was born, born in um, and grew up in Mexico City. He attended medical school at the National Autonomous University in Mexico and did residency in internal medicine and surgery uh, there. In 1989, he came to the MGH as a research fellow in the Pancreatic Research Laboratory of Dr. Andrew Warshaw, and in 1991, joined the staff in the Division of General and GI Surgery. He's currently the director of the Pancreas and Biliary Surgery Program, co-director of the MGH GI Cancer Center, and the Jorge and Darlene Perez Endowed Chair in Surgery at the MGH, as well as professor of surgery at Harvard. Uh, for several years, um, he has performed the largest number of pancreatic resections in the state of Massachusetts. He's a very prolific author. He's a very strong educator. He's won countless awards for his education efforts and has really been recognized by his uh, peers, students, residents, trainees um, for his contributions to their development. And so that's why we've had him um, here today. So. I don't know if you all are familiar with the show. There's some sort of standard questions that we'll ask at some point. But um, first, I'd just like to um, I'll say welcome um, to Carlos. Thank you. And, um, and I'll open just asking you to, um, to start, about, uh, start with talking about early on in your career. So was there a, a turning point, um, either in childhood or adolescence, or maybe in early adulthood, or an epiphany in your life when you knew what you wanted to do? Yes, my father is uh, an OBGYN, and uh, you know, since we were kids, we would, we would take us to the hospital, we would round with him, and I always found that nice. But then I was about 12 years old, and he took me to the OR. He actually made me scrub, and uh, I don't think we would get away with that here in the States. And I'll tell you, I was blown away. I said, this is the coolest thing ever, you know see the inside of someone and, and work in there, and I just became enamored with that. And then I fluctuated with many things as what I would do for life, but, but that was embedded in me, and I knew that I loved being in the operating Do you remember what the surgery was that they were doing? It must have been a hysterectomy, because he's a gynecologist, and, uh, but that was enough to turn me on, I guess. So you didn't get a glimpse of the pancreas at that point, I guess? No. Um, when, did, uh, when did your attention turn to the pancreas? So it was in residency. So I actually wanted to follow my father's footsteps and become a GYN surgeon. And I felt that it, to be a better GYN surgeon, I wanted to do training in surgery, formal training in surgery, and then do more specialized. And so I went into a residency in surgery thinking that that's what I was going to do. But then, you know, started to do GI surgery and started to love the physiology and said, no, I think I'm going to change careers. And then there was a particular surgeon, Dr. Campusano, who was the pancreas surgeon where I trained. And he was just an extraordinary technical surgeon, a very good teacher. And I just loved the way that he operated and I gravitated towards him. And then you start doing some projects and start reviewing some things. And then, you know, before you realize you're you're in that pathway. Yeah. What was it like training in Mexico? Um, are there any sort of uh, comparisons or uh, maybe differences than here that you think um, have either benefited or um, made challenges for you? Uh, so the training is definitely different. 
where I trained, before you could train for surgery, you had to do internal medicine. So you had to do two years of internal medicine. And they, they, they made a lot of emphasis on sort of the intellectual component of, of diagnosis and care. And then the training was very heavy on GI and endocrine surgery where I trained. Uh, it was lacking in trauma, so they would farm us out to some trauma hospitals, but you know, you're, it, it isn't the same thing where you're not from that hospital. Um, and then when I came to the States, you know, there's no question the best training programs in the world are here. They're very comprehensive, it's very well structured, and I think it's, uh, you know, the exposure to trauma, to vascular, to cardiothoracic surgery is much more than just sort of a token thing as where I train. On the other hand, I was, it was very heavy in GI surgery, and uh, it was a very quaternary care place, so we got referrals from all over the country for complex cases, and that offered me an opportunity to, to gain experience in that. Um, is there a single most uh, important thing you learned during residency that you can think of, or, or maybe a single important moment during residency that um, stands out to you? I think one of the things you, you learn, you, you go in, in surgery and you're so focused on doing the operation and the technical aspects of the operation, but I realized during residency that surgery obviously was a lot more. <laughs> it was making the right diagnosis and importantly taking care of the patient after. That that really, surgery was a lot more. You, you go in there thinking, oh, it's the technical stuff, but, but, but it's a lot more. And I think that was very well imprinted on us. And it, it is pretty much on any training program. And uh, you mentioned that you trained in internal medicine first. Was, did that help you with learning to take care of surgical patients, or was that integrated in any way? Absolutely. It, it, it helped in many ways. It helped us be a lot more thoughtful about diagnosis. It helped us be at the same level as our peers in internal medicine, so, so you felt you could, you could have that same dialogue. I think it helped me be a better doctor. Uh, yeah. And um, you're obviously from the many awards that you've won, sort of the consummate mentor for many people. Can you tell us a little bit about some of your mentors that you had? You mentioned the surgeon that first exposed you to the pancreas in Mexico, but maybe he or some too. My first mentor was my father. So he was, he was a great doctor and a great technical surgeon and you know, very clean, loud exposure, very methodical, at the same time, you know, very efficient. Uh, and, uh, you know, he always did things right, and so he was a model, he's been a model for me. Then Dr. Campusano was really the one who got me into pancreas and got me into principles of surgery, of exposure, of having a clean feel, of being very meticulous in what you do, and I admired. So where I trained, we did a lot of portal hypertension as well, so it was the era where there was no tips, so we did cable shunts and warren shunts, and so here as like every week there were many of these cases. And the surgeons who did that were very bloody surgeons, and it was loud and it was always messy, whereas the Dr. Camposano was calm, it was nice, and, and I like that. And he also was extremely careful with the care of his patients. And then later on, Andy Warshaw was my mentor. Uh, on the on understanding the disease of the pancreas, but, but more into what is an academic career, what to do, what are the steps you need to follow, uh, how to deal with problems, and uh, he's been a phenomenal, continues to be a phenomenal mentor. Um, you took an interest in surgery of the of benign diseases of the pancreas, really before it was widely embraced, um, you know, for first with pancreatitis and then with uh, cystic neoplasms of the pancreas. Um, how did that come about? Uh, do, you, do you regret it? <laughs> so, so, you know, they're saying that says success comes to those who grab the opportunity. So imagine I coming here as an outsider, you know, working alongside, you know, an international figure like Andy Warshall. Well, you know, you, you took what you could take and foster, right? And I saw that in pancreatitis, it was a very unique opportunity. And that, you know, that was started by Warshaw, but I started to collect the cases to get much more involved. I would be doing the cases, you know, he probably, he, he, he gave them all to me. And so you, I started to work in pancreatitis and, and I found that it was a very interesting, that there was a lot of work that needed to be done and, and started to do some writing. 
And then with the cystic tumors, it's, it's again, it's, it's grasping the opportunity. You know, it was clear that something needed to be studied in depth. And, uh, well, we were seeing the patients and you start to collect your data. And, you know, I think if any advice for any of the new people who start new is, you, know, you can't do everything. You may end up doing a lot, but you need to choose a couple of things where it's gonna be your forte. And then, Cultivate that, it takes some time. It's like planting a tree, it's gonna give fruit you know, in a few years, but you grab, you can't do, be deep on everything that you do. Were there ever times where you wanted to abandon ship on that? <laughs> uh, we actually did very well with the pancreatitis patients. Yes, yes, sometimes you took care of patients and you know, sometimes young patients who had a bad outcome and, and it sort of brings you down, but, but no, it was, it was exciting. So you've been married for 32 years and have nine children. Um, I, as a woman and a mother, often get asked to speak about um, work-life balance, but obviously you are the master of that. Uh, do you have any advice for us? What's your secret with work-life balance? Um, I have no credit. I think there is my wife's credit. She's, she's very bright, she's very smart. After we had our second child, she decided that she would stop working. And so she's been a full-time mother, as, as she's fond of saying, she's got nine full-time jobs, <laughs> 10 because she also takes care of me. And so I've been blessed with that model, blessed. I still think if you ask me what is the most important thing in my life, there is no question it's my family. And it's hard, as a surgeon, it's hard to balance that because you know your hours can be long and unpredictable. You also owe that time to your patients but you have to make it work out. You have to make it work out. And, uh, um, you know, compensate for when you can. You know, for example, on the weekends, I never take work home, right? So I will not even look at email. I won't look at, you know, do things, and I will devote them that time. My contrast, in the middle of the week, I'll be gone by 5.30 in the morning and come back, you know, by 9 or 10 p.m. But that's the way that, that it works for me. So protect your weekends? Yes good advice. Would you recommend medicine as a career for any of the nine of them? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have one who's uh, finishing internal medicine, who's going to do nephrology, sadly not surgery, but, uh, uh, but uh, yes, I think it is absolutely wonderful. It's a great career pathway, and, uh, you know, the, what you can do in terms of the interaction with people and helping people, but at the same time, science, and at the same time, you know, uh, thinking about problems is, is just wonderful. And um, what's the most gratifying aspect of your career, if you had to identify one or tell your children about one? So I, as I reflect on, on I love what I do. I, I tell people I have the best job in the world. I truly, genuinely love what I do. And of all the things I do, I think the one that gives me the most satisfaction is teaching. So I am privileged to work with very talented surgical residents and to have them in the operating room. So we have sort of an apprenticeship sort of model in the last year of residency for some services. So I get to work with one senior resident for six weeks or eight weeks. And it's absolutely wonderful. It's a privilege. And uh, to teach them what you can, to improve them, to show them where their strengths are, to uh, help them understand diseases, to, it's, it's, it's a privilege. So you, you talked about the surgeons in Mexico that you saw. Um, what do you think that your uh, trainees, or, or how do you think they would describe your operating room? Is it more of the calm, neat, um, quiet place? Or is it more of the crazy uh, cowboy portal vein? No, no, I think, I, I you know, well, they're, they're, they're the judges. I think my operating room is a calm place. Uh, I think, you know, an hepatopancreatic biliary surgeon should be calm. Uh, maybe people will disagree with me, and I don't do transplant, I don't do sort of a big liver surgery, but uh, it, it's a calm place. It's a, it, it, it is not stressful. Of course, sometimes at some points in the operation, it can be very stressful. Um, but even in, in those moments, you have to keep your calm and you're going to be more likely to succeed. 
It also should be fun. You know, I see you're in the operating room. I think you know, I enjoy myself in the operating room. I, 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 the, the residents, you know, typically the senior resident and then an intern or a student, the scrub, they're having fun. You know, there, there has to be things that conduce to, to, to do that. And, you know, the nurses, the scrub nurse, it, it, it's a team that if the team is very formal and serious and state, I don't think that works very well either. Yelling and screaming certainly doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us about some of your most memorable moments at work? I think one of the biggest surprises and satisfactions I've had, you know, this is about 12 or 13 years ago. Um, at the end of the, of the residency, you know, when we were doing the end of course sort of a celebration, uh, the residents came up with an award for teaching. There had never been a teaching award in the surgical residency program, you know, and, and when they started to say it, and they gave me the award, it was an enormous, enormous uh, moment of great personal satisfaction. Um, that, that, that I treasure very much. Very good. So during the, um, James Lipton, when he does the Inside the Actor's Studio, um, there's some Bernard Pavot questions that are sort of standard interview questions that he uh, gives the um, interviewee. So I'll, I'll go through some of those to help us get to know you a little bit better. Um, what's your favorite operation? Oh, the Whipple, hands down. What's your least favorite operation? Amputation, of course they don't do it. <laughs> but as a resident, it was, it was just awful. I mean, here you are as a first-year surgical resident, and the amputation is your case. You know, it, 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 I just it, it never, never found anything attractive to that. Yeah. What's your favorite surgical instrument? Oh, the pediatric sucker. I call it the baby sucker. <laughs> What's your least favorite surgical instrument? Ah, uh, the saw. I mean, <laughs> the amputation <laughs> brings, brings those memories. That the noise is just so. So yeah. uh, what's your most embarrassing moment? Well, I, I, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really misstep and, and embarrassing, but when our first son was being born, I was there with, with my wife. And, uh, you know, they had not put an epidural, and she was starting to get a lot of contractions. And they were very strong. You know, and I, I was raised up, you know, you don't complain, you just do what you have to do. And, you know, clearly they were very strong, and she started to complain pretty loudly. And uh, I, I felt a little bit sort of self-conscious for her, and I said, well, it can't be that bad. <laughs> and I've regretted saying that all my life. <laughs> Trust me, never never say that. I would imagine she brought that up the next eight times for oh, you. Oh, yes. <laughs> What's your favorite movie? The Mission. It's an old movie, I don't know, maybe 20 years old or more, you know, with Robert De Niro and yeah. Jeremy Irons. Wonderful, you know, the photography is spectacular, the music is spectacular, the, the plot and the whole message of the movie is great. I love those kinds of movies. You like the, with the big scenery and, and um, plot development? Yes, yeah. yes, wonderful. Um, what's your favorite word? Huh. <laughs> when I'm operating and things are going well and I'm giving feedback, I use the word echo, which actually is not a word in Spanish. It's sort of a, from slang. It means everything is going well. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of the message that things are forming. So, echo I, I use. What's your least favorite word? I, I don't think I have a least favorite word. I don't like curse words. And I don't like when the residents use curse words in the operating room. In fact, frown on that, you know. And say, um, My next question was, what is your favorite curse word? So, I guess you don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I mean, if I'm going to say something, I'll say darn it, for example. You know, but, mm -hmm. but that's, you know. What sound or noise do you love? Uh, I, I love piano music, classical piano music. I can relax enormously if I'm hearing it. That's an, a noise that I like. And what sound or noise do you hate? I 
I, 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 I don't like intense background noise. You know, sometimes in the operating room when you when you're everything's quiet and then you hear the all these noises going from all the machines. You know, sometimes it can get into you a little bit. Noise, you know, as, as I said, for example, the noise of the of the saw, it, it, it just brings in me a visceral reaction that is that is very <laughs> the saw the saw again. Uh, what music do you listen to in the operating room? So I, I like classical music, but I don't impose that in the operating room because a lot of people don't like it. So I let the resident or the nurses choose the station, I, unless it's country music, which I just. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, what other profession would you do if not a master surgeon? Well, I don't know that I'm a master surgeon. I mean, I'm a surgeon. Um, you know, I'm also a believer that you're not born to be one thing. You know, you can do many things. If, if I, I love architecture, you know, and sometimes seeing, you know, these buildings and these great things that are done, I say, we wouldn't have been nice to be able to create this or to design this would give them a normal satisfaction. But, yeah. Very good. So an architect. And what profession would you not want to do? Accountant. Yeah. I, I thought you were going to say construction worker with a saw. <laughs> yes. No. Uh, if not yourself, who would you be? Is there some celebrity or um, political figure? Or, um, be careful there. Some, someone you would aspire to be? I... I I never, never thought of, gee, I wish I would have been, you know, a singer or an artist or a, a public figure. Not really. I'm, I'm very content, genuinely content in who I am. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? First of all, welcome, I hope, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a Catholic guy. Faith is very important in my life. I try to do things right, and I think that's a very strong set of values that I've given my kids. It's helped me all my life, and, and uh, well, I hope when, when the end comes that the good things I've done are more than the bad things that I've done, <laughs> and that, you know, uh, that, it, that I will be welcome. Good. And what, what do you think the future of pancreas surgery is? Well, that's a very big question. I think... Uh, I think it should be to lowering complications. I think we've, we've all seen how mortality has come down in the last 30 years, and uh, now we're used to single low-digit mortality. I think that's the way it should be. I think uh, we're still are fraught with very high percent of complications, and I think the future of surgery, of pancreatic surgery, should be towards um, no pancreatic fistula, so that we will find a way to to uh, to prevent it, and, 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 or or the techniques that are going to lead to minimizing it in a big way, to little or no delayed gastric emptying. You know that complication that frauds us all, and that we can't understand sometimes. Why it's happening. Do you think that'll happen in your lifetime? <laughs> I, I I don't know if uh, delayed gastric emptying is going to happen in my lifetime. Um, I think the other area in pancreatic surgery is going to be a appropriateness of the operation. So we've all um, operated on patients for pancreatic cancer and seen some of those patients recur in a very short period of time and die. You know, clearly those patients are not benefiting from the operation. I think as we're moving into more and more new adjuvant treatment, um, we're selecting some of those patients that have not because they have progressed, but we will we continue to see these failures. And I think uh, in, in we're going to find ways to identify those patients well. And, and perhaps the future is no surgery for them. In terms of the minimally invasive, I think uh, you know clearly that's a that's a current that is here to stay. Uh, I I do laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy. We do in the hospital are dabbling with robotic distal pancreatectomy, not with the Whipple. I'm not going to do that in my lifetime. Uh, whether that's going to be the dominant way to do this complex operation, I don't know. I think uh, it's going to undergo a lot of scrutiny, and, and, and uh, 
maybe it will be. Maybe it will be that, that the robots are going to get even better and better and, 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 and make it easier and make it safer and make it faster and that this is going to be cost efficient. So time will tell. I, I can't predict that. I can't predict. I see a lot of interest, uh, but I fear that some of that interest is driven by reasons different than trying to improve the operation. So I don't know. Yeah. Are there any um, questions from the audience at all? Feel free to um, come up and use our microphones here. You know, young minds learning from you. Um, what is it about the Whipple operation that you love so much? Oh, I, I love the dissection. I, I love the standardization of the reconstruction. So, you know, the dissection is always different, right? They're like snowflakes. Every whipple is different, you know, the degree of the size of the tumor, the involvement of the vein, the connection with other things, whether there's prior surgery or not. But the reconstruction is fairly standard, and it's nice to get to that phase of the operation where you know, I got an hour and a half, a specimen is out, I need to do the reconstructions, and you do it the same way all the time. Um, and taking the resident doing that. I'm not doing that, the resident is doing that. Yeah. So if you had your choice, would you rather do a Whipple with an intern, a mid-level resident, a senior resident, or a fellow, or by yourself? Uh, I, I, I love doing it with a senior resident. I also like to do it with a junior resident, like a second or third year. And sometimes they're very technically good, and, and if they're very technically good, they're gonna do you know, the operation, pretty much the whole thing. Yeah. An intern frustra would frustrate me a little bit because you need somebody who can reliably tie and do things, and, and yeah. maybe that would create a little bit of uncertainty. Um, we've had very few fellows in, in, in our program, so, so our, our in I work mostly with residents, although we do have a, a surgical oncology fellowship. I personally don't work with the fellow as much, but the times that I've done it, of course, it's, it's wonderful. It's like working with a senior resident plus. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time here today. My pleasure. I really thank appreciate you. it. So.